Hi everyone, my name is Chris Fulp and I work at Keene Public Library in the adult programming. And today I wanted to have an adult story time and talk about extraordinary pets. More specifically, extraordinary dogs and service dogs to be exact. And service dogs are fascinating animals that have worked hard and trained in order to be able to do what they do, which is just incredible. You've got dogs that work for the president or work for the police or work as search and rescue finding lost individuals or finding drugs or bombs or dead bodies or anything like that. So dogs, really, these trained service dogs really do go everywhere and do everything that a person would do and they do a lot of things that people can't do and I think that is a wonderful wonderful thing and I want to read you a couple of stories or parts of excerpts from books that are available through our cardinal system or at King Public Library for you to read and really just introduce you to some works that discuss these ex types of extraordinary animals all right, let's get started. A type of training that some d service dogs get is training to be overseas, working with military in order to find uh, explosives or the enemy or anything like that. And these dogs become an integral part of teams of soldiers. And I wanted to read you an excerpt from a book that is written about one of these particular dogs. So I would like to read out of the book Top Dog, The True Story of Marine Hero Luca by Maria Gudovic. And this book was just published by Penguin in 2014. And I'm just going to read an excerpt from it so we can discuss it. All right. So the excerpt I'm going to read start begins with 30 feet ahead. Marine Corporal Juan Rod Rodriguez crunched across the dry farm field, his right hand resting on the M4 strapped to his chest. He kept clear of the path that meandered through the hard clumps of dirt that looked nothing like the rich soil of his New England roots. The road less traveled, ideally no road at all, was the safest from the homemade bombs sowed by the Taliban. This was the Nehiri Sarah district in southern Afghanistan's Helmand River Valley, and a war unlike those of previous generations. Rod watched his dog, a German Shepherd Belgian Illinois mix that was 30 feet ahead and inspecting the land for IEDs. His eyes swept the area, keeping watch for anything suspicious. Unlike much of the agricultural land around here, this field was barren, not a sea of young poppies a month away from opium harvest. Furrows here and there hinted at past crops, but it was mostly flat, which made for easy maneuvering in the distance, a compound, a tree line, and further out, some worn down old mountains. Rod continued walking and observing. He could see his dog trotting with purpose, nose down, tail up, knowing just what to do. It was March 23, 2012, just one month shy of her six month anniversary as a Marine. With two deployments behind her, she was an old pro at the business of sniffing improvised explosive devices while off-leash. Good girl, Mama Luca, he said under his breath. Luca Bear, Luca Pie, Bearcat Jones, Mama Luca. The twelve Special Forces soldiers had come to know military working dog Luca K-458 by all the nicknames Rod used for her. The terms of endearment she had inspired during her career. She had led more than 400 missions, and no one had gotten hurt by an IED when they were with her. Mama Luca was the name that had stuck lately. She was the only one at the remote combat at post the Green Berets felt comfortable hugging after a tough day or when they missed home. She was more like she was more experienced than some of the soldiers, and the maternal, maternal money, moniker was a natural fit. Rod saw Luca moving close to the narrow dirt path. Luca, come, he called. She paused for a beat, looked at him, and kept sniffing. That wasn't normal. She almost always listened, but Rod could sense she was on to something. 
He didn't want to distract her, so he let her continue, watching her intently in case he needed to steer her clear of suspicious-looking spots. She walked back and forth, nose to the ground, and every few steps, she turned more quickly as she traced the scent to its point of origin. Luca's luxuriant tail gave a few high, quick wags, looking momentarily like a victory flag. She stopped and stared at Rod. He got the message, automatically imagining her words. Hey, Dad, got one, right here. He called her back and praised her with his voice an octave higher than normal. Good girl, Luca. He patted her side a few times, but left the Kong in his cargo pocket because throwing a robbery reward around a place like this was a bad idea. Ben, he called to the engineer who was close behind. Luca just responded. Right there, he pointed to the spot, four fingers extended. Okay, we'll take care of it, Ben said. Nice work, Mama Luca. Rod shifted their course to the left to keep Luca away from the IED and the trail. She trotted ahead for about 25 feet, spun around, and headed back toward him. Rod clipped close watch, realizing she may have locked onto the scent of another explosive. Where there's one, there's often at least one more. The cloud of gray smoke erupted before Rod heard the explosion. A scream pierced the boom, and a sickening thud had to follow. Rod couldn't see Luca through the thick mass that hung in the air. He shouted, No! and squeezed his helmet hard between his hands, hoping he'd wake up from every dog handler's worst nightmare. Radios around him buzzed in a frenzy, but he couldn't hear words, just felt the surge of adrenaline that instantly made Luca his sole focus. As the curtain of debris curled away, he could make out his dog. She had dragged herself up and was standing, dazed, alive. Rod dashed toward her. He didn't think about the IEDs that could be between him and her. Luca could take only a few unsteady steps before Rod reached her. He leaned down and swept her up into his arms, trying not to notice the smell of her fur and f burnt fur and flesh. Snipers stuck, struck at times like these. Rod wanted to run to the tree line with his dog to hide her from them, but the blood poured from her leg and he couldn't take a chance she would bleed out. He laid her on the ground and ripped a combat application tourniquet from just inside his flak jacket. They were in easy reach. He could grab a tourniquet and apply it with one hand to save his own life, or anyone else's. The blood streamed and the soil softened under Luca. He saw clearly now that her left paw and a few inches above it had been torn away in the blast, exposing the bone, muscle, and tendons of her mid-leg. It was like something out of the dog anatomy images Rod and his classmates had studied in canine school, only with an alarming coat of red. Luca panted hard, whimpering every quiet, every few breaths. Focus, focus, wrote Rod, told himself. He wrapped the tourniquet strap around her shoulder, twisted the plastic stick. The bleeding slowed. Good. He picked her up again and cradled her close. She melted into him, relaxing as he ran with her to the tree line sixty feet away. He gently pushed, placed her down again, and the green berets pulled security around them, weapons and eyes facing outward, protecting the dog team. Rod grabbed another tourniquet and positioned it closer to Luca's injury. She had bled all over his pants as he carried her. An extra tourniquet never killed anyone, right, Luca? He secured it. Scott, an 18 Delta medic, ran over. Rod drew his first conscious breath since the explosion. Special Forces medics are some of the most experienced and efficient medical trauma technicians in the world, and veterinary care is one of their many areas of expertise. Scott checked the tourniquets and injected Luca in the thigh with a dose of morphine. Her panting slowed, her body relaxed, but she remained aware, eyes open. They checked out the burns on her neck, chest, and face, and bandaged her leg and shoulder. Scott took a sharpie from his aid bag and wrote 14 hundred on the time tag of the upper tourniquet. Luca shifted his, her gaze to the sky. Rod looked and saw the medevac helicopter traveling its way toward them. The Black Hawk landed just far enough away that the wash didn't disturb Luca. They loaded her up and Rod got in. Special Forces Sergeant Jake Park returned around briefly from his lookout and gave his friends a thumb up. Rod returned it and the Black Hawk rose straight up and headed east towards Camp Leatherneck. GDIEDs, Parker thought as the helicopter disappeared and the farmland became silent. That dog had better not die. And I'm going to stop there, but the dog did not die. We'll just go tell you, let you that, or no, right then. Go ahead and tell you that. But this is a story about what dogs do and the risks they face, which are the same risks that the human soldiers face. And 
I think that it is incredibly interesting that a dog can also be a veteran and that they are put into situations where the lives of humans truly depend on the dogs finding the dangerous IEDs and everything else. And I don't think we think about it often about how much we use extraordinary animals that have been trained to do certain things in order to get on with our day-to-day -day life. And I think it is incredibly interesting that we take the time and we train animals in order to do things that a lot of times we depend on humans to do. These extraordinary animals are magnificent and it is a true testament to the spirit of animals and these dogs and the training they are given and the care they receive as to what they manage to do and I think it is just wonderful. There is an author who is local to us here in King named Libby Bagney and she has written three books that are about the plot hound which is North Carolina state dog. A lot of times the plot hound will work with the police office and so I wanted to share these books with you so you know they're available but since they're written more for children I didn't plan on reading them for you today. So let me just show you what she's written just so you know it's available. So there's Lucky's Plot and she has also written one lucky dog and a book specifically about plot hounds with the police department called K9 Detectives A Plot Hound Tale. And I wanted to mention her so you know that she's local to us and she's written books for children which is wonderful. But I'm going to start with a different book that still is talking about dogs that work with the police department. The book that I want to talk to you today about that is about police dogs is actually not solely about police dogs, but this one is called Extraordinary Dogs, and it is a collection of true stories about dogs in all kinds of service who have done extraordinary things. And the Authors are Liv Starrendes and John Schlim, and this was published in 2019 by St. Martin's Press. And I'm going to read you a small excerpt about a bloodhound that is also a police officer. So, this is Scout, and he is in Boulder, Colorado. And let's go ahead and read a little bit about Scout. So, I became a handler because I love dogs and love helping people, says Katie Tack, a sheriff's deputy with the Boulder County Sheriff's Department. I knew the only way to make my job even more fun was to have a dog riding around with me all day. For Katie, this service is a family tradition. Her father was also a police officer who handled three canines during his 40-year career. I grew up with working dogs my entire life and was fascinated by what they were capable of. She says, two of my dad's dogs were single-purpose narcotics dogs, and one was a dual-purpose narcotics and patrol. The patrol dog, Cisco, was a large black German shepherd with a huge head. He was our first, so I was pretty young when, we, when he had him. Most people found him scary due to his size, bark, and bite at work. However, he was the sweetest dog we ever had at home. My memories of Cisco are of him getting me out of bed every morning for school. I was a stubborn sleeper and he would climb up into my bed and use his huge head to roll me out of bed. He'd also sleep on the floor in front of the TV with me whenever I stayed home sick. Like her dad, Katie has shown true dedication in her efforts as a dog handler from day one. In fact, you could say she has thrown herself into work in a most unique way. In order to earn my place as a handler, I first had to serve time as a decoy, Katie says with left. This involved climbing into a bite suit and acting like a big squeegee toy for the patrol dogs. I took a three-day class 
in which I learned how to properly tape bites while protecting myself and the dog. It's a hot, sweaty, and usually painful job, but someone has to do it so we can have properly trained canines. It also taught me the patience and grit it takes to be a handler. After going through an interview process, Katie was chosen to be paired with the department's newest recruit, a 90-pound red and black bloodhound named Scout, a fitting moniker for a trailing dog. Scout is capable of finding people by their specific scent, Katie explains. At the beginning of a trail, he's shown a scent article, such as a piece of clothing that only has the person's scent on it. He can then find the person while only following the scent and ignoring any other scents from people who might have walked over that trail. Katie points out that the trailing dogs like Scout differ from tracking dogs, who are trained only to follow the freshest scent. Scout is trained and certified through search and rescue dogs of the United States and currently has a suburban trailing certification. Scout is typically used to locate lost children or elderly people with dementia, she says. Early in his career, Scout was enlisted to help locate an elderly man with Alzheimer's who had wandered away from home. The man had been missing for a few hours and it was very hot out, Katie recalls. The challenge with this case was that the man walked his neighborhood with his wife every single day. Scout is capable of following trails up to two days old, so when we started it was hard to tell if Scout was following the most recent trail or the one that of the many walks the man had gone on. We ended up trailing for five miles in the heat. Scout stopped multiple times along the way to swim in the fountains in the neighborhoods, and the other officers and myself had to stop for water breaks since our barn armory is not heat friendly. Fortunately, the man turned up at a store on Main Street after a few hours, overheated and exhausted from walking so far. Scout and I were on his trail about a mile behind him, Katie says. After the man was checked by human tees, I was able to allow Scout to find him at the store, which helped give Scout the closure that he was working towards something and that he did a good job. Bloodhounds, like Scout, are ideal for search and rescue. It's been ingrained in their DNA for hundreds of years. Bloodhounds have been bred since the Middle Ages to attract deer, boar, and people by scent. When they put their nose to the ground, their long, droopy ears drag along the ground, kicking up scent, which helps them during trailing. Unfortunately, the droopy skin on their face also tends to cover their eyes when their nose is to the ground. This is terrible for their eyesight and causes them to rely more on their nose, which is what we want. Their excessive amount of drool helps to trap scent as well. Bloodhounds are typically run on lead because they have a tendency to only follow their nose and may not return if they catch a scent they like. Katie explains how working together on missions with Scout is an ongoing process of learning from one another and striving to form that all-important bond. When Scout came to us, he was extremely shy at first due to lack of exposure, she recalls. People scared him, fire hydrant scared him, crunchy leaves on the ground scared him. Everything scared him. Since I've had him, I've tried to take every opportunity to socialize him. A vital part of Scout's socialization has been visiting regularly with the folks who work in the sheriff's office, as well as the people he and Katie met on the trails, and even the kids whom Scout gets to meet when doing public demonstrations. Our relationship is constantly evolving, Katie says. When I first got Scout, it took us some time for us to figure out each other. He struggled for a while trying to understand what I wanted from him, and I struggled to figure out how to tell him what I wanted. I wanted him to go along with my roommate's dog, but he wanted to jump on top of that dog and chew on its legs. I wanted him to sleep on his bed, but he wanted to sleep on my bed. We eventually compromised with the couch. After about six months, we got more comfortable with each other, and Scout matured. I convinced him that I was the alpha, which I think can be difficult with a male dog and a female handler. Scout depends on me to feed him every day, provide a one place for him to sleep, and give him affection in the form of praise and head pats. I depend on him to find that last child or adult who might be freezing while they are wandering in the cold. At the end of the day, our canines are tools. We use them for so many different things, and our job would be much more difficult without them. But I think most handlers can't help but treat them as a partner and a friend as well. When you spend 10 hours a day riding around in a car together, you can't help but form friendship. It's that friendship that helps this pair keep their community of Boulder a safe and happy place, especially when it comes to chasing down the bad guys. 
One time, Scout and I were called out to track a criminal, Katie recalls. The subject had stolen a car and threatened a citizen with a weapon. He soon rolled the car in a residential neighborhood and fled on foot, leaving the car on its roof in the middle of the road. Scout and I were assigned to start a track from the car, while another canine's team performed the area searches in the neighborhood. There was broken glass, drug, needles, and Louis Vuitton bags scattered on the ground around the car. I collected a scent article by carefully reaching into the vehicle while it was upside down and swabbing the driver's seat. Scout and I tracked the subject throughout the neighborhood for about two miles. Scout led us to an open garage and stopped, but we couldn't locate the criminal. We found out we had missed him by less than five minutes. The criminal had stolen a vehicle from inside the garage when the owner had taken some groceries into the house. Fortunately, Scott was able to give us a direction of travel from the garage because he can still track someone in a vehicle for short distances. Katie is grateful every day for a big, furry, drooling partner. She's the first to tell you how much her life has been changed for the better in many different ways because of Scout. When I was selected as Scout's handler, the department moved me to the parks di division. Katie explains, this means I get to spend my shifts hiking trails with Scout while enforcing county ordinances and enjoying the view for the summers. It's taken a lot of stress out of my job, and I'm sure it's helped my health by getting out me out of the patrol car. My home life has changed as well. I moved into a house with a large yard so that Scout can run freely. I also replaced some of my furniture because Bloodhound Drool is not friendly to cloth couches, and I've gotten used to wiping Drool off the ceiling from his... Beethoven-like head shakes. Plus, I quickly learned that the sound of his ears slapping his face in the morning means it's time to get up and feed him. Otherwise, he'll come into my bedroom and put his nose in my face. Katie finds herself especially in awe of Scout's unique skills. Scout is a hero to me because he's capable of finding lost, distressed people just by giving a scent article. What an amazing gift it is to be able to see exactly where someone walked just by their scent. And after possibly saving someone's life by finding them, it's all just a game to him. Scout doesn't understand that he might have saved a person's life. All he knows is that he won the game, and he gets a treat and praise for me, his most important person. Bloodhounds, by their very nature, are a lot of work and sometimes can sometimes be a challenge. They are well known for being stubborn and tireless. They can be difficult to be to obedience, train, and handle leash. And when they catch a scent, it's pretty difficult to stop them from going after it. Scout can and has pulled me off my feet, leaped off small cliffs, pulled me into traffic, and tried to cross deep, fast-moving water while blindly following his nose, Katie says. And during the summer, they can overheat quickly due to the nature of their coat. So handlers have to monitor them closely while tracking in the heat because bloodhounds will just keep on going despite dehydration, burn paddle pads, or heat stroke. Despite all of this, Katie wouldn't change a thing about her partner. It's all worth it because he makes me laugh every day. She says, every day I also learn something new about him, such as what certain mannerisms mean, or how to train him better, or even how to read his body language better on a track. With Scout, life is a constant adventure. Alright, so that was about Scout and Extraordinary Dogs. And it's really interesting to hear about how a dog can help a police um, department. And I think that's really unique. All right. When looking for examples of extraordinary dogs and stories, I happen across a story about a CI dog that helped a man get out of the two towers. And there is a book written about this, and it is called Thunder Dog. The True Story of a Blind Man, His Guide Dog, and the Triumph of Trust. And it's by Michael Hingson. And that was the gentleman who survived the Twin Tower collapse and terrorist attack because of his CI dog. And I think this is a fascinating story and truly remarkable. But. The story is a little long for me to read the whole thing, so I found this same, the a shorter version of the story. So this story is from the man who survives own uh, words and is truly really very very fascinating. But there are there is also a collection of stories that was published in 2014 by Arvington Press. 
that is called Man's Best Hero, True Stories of Great American Dogs, and it's by Ace Collins. And in this book, there are stories of dogs that have rescued people all everywhere in every kind of way. But the story about a seeing eye dog that has rescued a man that rescued a man from the Twin Towers is also in here. And I wanted to read that for you. So this chapter of the book is chapter five and it is called Duty and it says the dog terrorists could not defeat. And so that this this collection of stories is a collection of different dogs that have saved and rescued people in various situations and dogs that have been in war and everything else but so it's very good and let's go ahead and get started with the duty the dog terrorists could not defeat I came to realize that life lived to help others is the only one that matters and that is my duty this is my highest and best use as a human Ben Stein okay there are moments etched in time created by events that are too shocking for the human mind to fully comprehend. By dramatically reshaping history, these incidents seem to stop time as well. They are never owned by a single individual, but are rather a collective moment that leaves a sharply focused imprint on every person that experiences them. No matter their age or station in life, they might be best defined as the moments when everything changed. If you go back in history 240 years, that moment etched in time was April 19, 1775. It was defined as the shot heard round the world, thanks to that first blast of gunfire a revolution began. Though it took a while for the news to make its way to every part of the new world, it became a date deeply inscribed in the minds of people who would some come, soon call, come to be called Americans. After all, it changed their world forever. On April 12, 1861, more shots were fired and another war, war began at Fort Sumter, South Carolina. It was on this day the bloody Civil War tested the country's resolve for unity. For generations, that spring date remained front and center in the minds of millions as the moment when a bloodbath began and when everything changed. Eighty years later, on December 7, 1941, radios across America broke into regular Sunday programming with the news the Japanese had attacked the United States. In truth, many had no idea where Pearl Harbor was but they fully understood the uncertainty that lay ahead. They knew that because of that, news today was much different than yesterday, and there was no going back. September 11, 2001 has a great deal in common with that trio of other riveting days in American history, but there is one exception that makes this event different. Those living in the country in 1775 knew that the colonists would eventually wage war against King George. The only question was when. The same held true for those anticipating the Civil War and World War II. Americans were going to war. Those happened to be the moments that finally made the dreaded fact a reality. But no one could have guessed that on Tuesday in September that New York City and Washington, D.C. were going to be attacked. It was so far beyond the realm of thinking that a week after the horrific events, many still couldn't believe the attacks had happened. But all they had to do was look around to see how much the events of one day had shaken a nation to its core. Beyond the manner of the attack, a small band of men hijacking the airplanes and using them as weapons, the fact is, the fact it was the first strike by an outside force on American mainland is almost two and a half centuries, and because of modern technology, 9-11 has been deeply imprinted into the minds of hundreds of millions. Never had history been so well documented. Almost from the beginning, it was a broadcast live. Americans didn't just hear about the events. They saw people die and watched buildings collapse. In an instant, the country shuddered with a wave of insecurity and doubt that still affects us today. If ever there was a moment when everything changed, it was this one. 
In all of the events that have been etched into history, heroes have arisen. There have, they have led when others have, could barely move. They have shown resolve and courage. They have put others' needs ahead of their own. On September 11, 2001, many men and women found the courage to lead and inspire, and so did one yellow dog. On that late summer morning in the World Trade Center Tower 1, 51-year-old Michael Hingson arrived early, unlocked the door to Office Suite 7827, and began setting up for a conference. He was in charge of the New York offices of Quantum slash ATL, a data protection and network storage company. On this day, he had an important meeting with six men from another firm that was interested in Quantum slash ATL's services. While the jovial, fair-skinned man worked in his suit and tie, his constant companion, a yellow Labrador retriever, slept under his desk. The two-year-old dog's name was Roselle, and she was a guide dog. As he checked and rechecked the needs of his soon-to-arrive visitor, Hingston yawned. It had been an early morning. When a thunderstorm rolled into New York City, it exposed once more Roselle's phobia of lightning and thunder. She was deathly scared of them. Thus, she had awakened her master early, even before the bad weather arrived, fretting about issues he could neither see nor do anything about. Hingston was both amused and frustrated that a dog that had no fear of walking the crowded streets of one of the world's largest and noisiest cities and would matter-of-factly fly in planes and ride in subways became a terrified puppy when confronted by a thunderstorm. Blind almost since the moment of his birth, Hingson had been raised in Southern California by parents who treated him no differently than their sighted son. He was encouraged to always expand his horizons and leap over the world's conceptions of what someone without sight could accomplish. He was mainstreamed in school before that term was even recognized by the educational community, and by honing in on his other senses, he found his way around the school and community as well as most with 2020 vision. After high school, he went to college and then on to graduate school. As a student and then as a young man, he was popular, outgoing, and a leader. He was so engaging that people often forgot the happy-go-lucky, charismatic soul was blind. With guide dog in hand, Hingston began a career in computing and then sales. He traveled millions of miles in both the United States and around the world. He spent almost as much time in airports and on planes as he did at home. He only cut back on his almost non-step schedule and embraced an office job when he got married. His drive and attitude paved the way for him to move up the ladder quickly and brought him to a station in life where this prestigious World Trade Center was his business address. As he began what he thought was just another normal day, he had no way of knowing that his being on the 78th floor of Tower 1 would lead to his dog helping to save lives in the midst of a nightmare few could even begin to imagine. Though many think what guide dogs do is almost magical, nothing could be further from the truth. Like Roselle, these canine companions simply work as a team with their masters. It is not as much instinct as it is education that creates an animal that is trained to lead, protect, and serve. When on harness, they are focused and driven to play out their roles, but off harness, they once again become just another dog. On 9-11, Roselle would use that training, and even, when challenged, go beyond. At 8.46, Hingson was in the conference room when he and a co-worker, David Frank, heard a tremendous explosion. A moment later, the men felt the entire building dramatically lean to one side. Only by grabbing onto a table did they remain on their feet. Because of his California roots, the first thought in Hingson's mind was that it was an earthquake. And to shake a structure like the tower, it had to be a big one, too. As the men held on for dear life, the building continued to lean. Ceiling tiles started to fall, and chairs began rolling. Then almost as soon as it had begun, the structure righted itself, and all at once, more seemingly quiet. But just beyond the building's outside walls, in a, different, in a world Hingson could not see, things were now much different. Frank walked over to the windows. He watched in disbelief as glass, paper, and debris flew past him and down towards the streets. Below, after filling things on what was he was seeing, the two men decided it was in their best interest to evacuate. Six guests were waiting in the outer office, and Hingston rushed out, informing the confused men some kind of accident had happened, and that they should go to the stairwell and get out of the tower as quickly as possible. 
After the group left, Hingston hurried back into his office and was shocked to find the dog that had fretted over a small thunderstorm early that morning was still asleep under his desk. Only her master coming into the room had roused her from her slumber. She observed Michael shut down the computer system and put <clears throat> files away before grabbing the harness and announcing forward. With no hesitation, the guide dog went to work. The floor's lobby was crowded. From every part of the room, people were asking if anyone knew what had happened. Most figured it had been a fire, maybe a bomb, and some hinted at some kind of horrific accident. No one guessed that a fully loaded jet airliner, American Flight 11, had been purposely flown into the building's north side and had destroyed floors 93 to 99. At that moment, not knowing the truth was likely a good thing. As people rushed to the stairwell, smoke began to fill the room, and Hingston had his first hint as to the cause of the explosion. He sensed something he had smelled at airports, but he couldn't put his finger on exactly what it was. At that very moment, as much as 3,000 gallons of fuel was burning at over 2,000 degrees, just 10 floors above his head. Roselle's first instinct was to lead Hingston to the elevator. That was the normal route when leaving the office, yet the fact the smoke was in that smoke was indicative of a fire pushed the man on the stairwell. Instincts combined with a common sense led him to feel the safest escape was to walk down the 78 floors rather than the normal and much faster method. As would be proven by those who had gotten into the elevators and died, his by-the-book judgment was spot on. Another thing working in Hingston's favor and giving him a confidence to trust the steer stairs was experience. He liked to explore. Even as a child, he constantly pushed his boundaries and mapped out new areas of his world. In his time in the World Trade Center, he had spent countless hours investigating the buildings with Roselle. Hence, they were almost as familiar with the tower as the maintenance staff. So naturally, unlike many of the sighted people, the dog and the man had no problem finding the stairwell. B. With his friend Frank still at his side and the dog leading the way, Hingston pushed out of the smoke and into the seemingly safe confines of the concrete stair-filled chamber leading both up and down. There was no question which direction they were going. At first, navigating the 19 steps between floors was not that difficult, and they managed an almost normal pace working their way downward. But within a few hundred floors, hundreds of other refugees had joined them. Soon it was thousands, and this massive convergence of confused workers and guests slowed their pace to a crawl. For the sighted, claustrophobia often overrules reason. In the crowded conditions with movement all but slow to a stop, with the temperatures rising and no one aware of what had caused this combustible situation, many were beginning to panic. Those trapped in the slow climb down the stairs were urging people forward, pleading with the line to keep moving, and even pushing a bit. Hingston could not only sense the crowd's fear, he could smell it. He was sure Roselle could as well. Reaching down, he gently stroked the young dog's head, assuring her with his touch everything was going to be all right. The golden lab didn't seem to need much comforting. She was as steady as a rock. It was hard to believe this was the same animal that was trembling a few hours before simply because of a bit of lightning and thunder. Suddenly, Hingston sensed that Roselle's demeanor might serve a great use in the crowded stairwell. Finding his voice, he explained the dog was so well trained, if there was any imminent danger, she would let them know. As she was now so relaxed, there was nothing to fear. As they observed the dog, folks began to calm down. This was a kind of leadership that likely wasn't considered during her guide dog, tra guide dog training. But thanks to that training, her demeanor was taking the edge off a potentially volatile environment. A few seconds later, when the line started to move, Roselle again led the way. As the long line of refugees inched downward, a woman voiced a concern that Hingston hadn't even considered. What would happen to them if the lights went out? How would they climb down in the dark? The blind man, his tone confident, once again chimed in, explaining that darkness was his native habitat, and so it would be no problem. He and the dog could lead them, lights out or not. They were almost halfway down when someone shouted for everyone to stop and move to the right. A few seconds later, four men carried a badly burned woman down the stairwell. After she had passed, Hingston realized what he had first smelled back in his office. It was jet fuel. A plane must have flown into the tower. That explained everything, including the woman's burns, because something similar had happened at the Empire State Building in 1945. He figured it was likely nothing more than a tragic accident. 
and since the trade centers had been built to withstand such a disaster, Furman could no doubt soon have this episode under control. He would likely be back at work in a day or two. So now, as they began to descend deeper in the stairwell, he soon felt a sense of relief. Roselle was panting deeply and had to be getting tired, but she didn't complain or even try to sit down. When she was given the chance, she moved forward, one step after another, and as the people around the dog watched her work, they seemed to gain courage and patience too. If the dog wasn't worried, then there was no reason to be that concerned. Who would have thought that a dog would have been the calming force during this bizarre ordeal? Frank, Hingson, Roselle, and the others from floor 78 were close to floor 40 when the first fireman met them in the stairwell. One of the commanders even stopped to check on the refugees. He was great concerns about the blind man. He even offered to escort Hingston down to safety. Hingston assured him that thanks to Roselle, he was far better off than anyone else. With a smile and a wave, he convinced the fireman to continue on his way. He would never find out if the rescue worker made it out alive. On the third, 33rd floor, a stairwell entry opened and a man handed out water bottles of water. This simple act of charity buoy, buoyed the spirits of those slowly inching their way towards the main lobby. Even Roselle got the chance to quench her thirst. Moods remained high until a few minutes later when the lights suddenly went out. For everyone except the blind man, the morning had become as black as night been night. People were scared, and for some, it felt as though the walls were closing in. This was the moment when panic seemed really to over wool drips away. Nothing to worry about, Hingson assured them as he figured out what had happened. The blind man's word and ability to deal with the situation brought a sense of calm, and a few seconds later, the march to the lobby continued. Making a step and then waiting was hard on the mind and the body, and at the 20th floor, things had begun, even, became even more complicated and dangerous as water began to first leak and then almost pour into the stairwell. The building sprinkler systems were waging a futile war to stop the fires. The liquid, raced down, li the liquid raced downward and into the stairwells, making a continuous stream of waterfalls. Thus the footing was, footing was now unsure and people were leaning against the wall and each other to keep their balance. Yet even in the dark, while padding down wet steps, Roselle never stumbled. She kept moving and people kept following. Fifteen very long minutes later, those who ducked into the stairwell on the 78th floor were finally at the lobby. <clears throat> Boyd, buoyed by a great rush of hope, they emerged from the darkness and into the light. They were greeted not by open arms and a sense of great hope, but by absolute chaos. People were running everywhere. First responders were racing in from the streets as building workers rushed out. Chairs had been knocked over, glass was broken, and people were screaming. Policemen were encouraging the crowd to keep moving, but some were seemingly frozen, their eyes locked onto images they couldn't quite believe. It was a mix of bedlam, usually only found in Hollywood disaster films. But in this case, the drama was real. Amid all the confusion and panic, Roselle tra tranquilly waited. Maybe better than anyone on that day, she fully grasped the only thing to fear was fear itself and she felt none. As people dashed in every direction, Frank leaned over to Hingston and said, we need to get out of here. Roselle, Roselle instantly moved forward, guiding Hingston around furniture and panicked building employees, while occasionally stopping to allow policemen and firemen to pass. When they finally made it out into the street, they were greeted by a gaggle of reporters wanting to know what they had seen. As witnesses shared what they knew, Hingston finally learned what had actually happened. This had been a terrorist attack. The planes had been used as weapons. Both towers were on fire, and hundreds of people, and hundreds or perhaps thousands had died. The news was so sobering he could barely comprehend what it meant. Why would someone do this? What could be the purpose? Now with the full toll of the disaster setting in, he realized he had someone he had to reach. Ordering Roselle to stop, Hingston pulled out his cell phone and tried to call his wife. He couldn't get a signal. As he hit redial, Frank gave his friend a blow-by-blow of what he was seeing. Both buildings were on fire. People were leaping from the top floors to keep from being burned alive. Huge trunks of concrete and large pieces of steel framing littered the ground and broken glass was everywhere. And then, at 9.59, came that horrible sound. Far from being over, this nightmare was just beginning. Hingston felt the urge to cover his ears to try and muffle the long, growing rumble that sounded like a hundred tornadoes striking at once. The ground shook. Tower 2 groaned, people screamed, and a curtain of debris fell. 
Then the building started to collapse. Run, Frank yelled, not bothering to explain why. Easton didn't have to be asked twice. The blind man knew, had no idea what was in front of him. He simply had to trust the dog to guide him to safely along a sidewalk filled with frightened masses, trying to escape the same horror that was chasing him as well. Giving Roselle the order, they raced forward. Though he could not see the cloud of dust that quickly enveloped them, Hingston could feel it coating his hair, face, and body. It was sticking to his lips, invading his mouth, and pushing into his throat. He could barely breathe and had no idea what was in his path or who was around him, and without any urging, Roselle kept moving. The long walk down the stairwell it was just an extension of the training Roselle had received in guide dog school. The patience she exhibited was also part of that training. So except for the heat, smell, and crowded conditions, there was nothing unusual about the experience inside the building. She had simply done what a guide dog was supposed to do. But this new dynamic made everything different. As she turned onto Front Street, she likely could see nothing, while the sounds of Tower 2 falling were still echoing in her ears. Behind her, lapping her heels, was a war zone filled with scared and confused people and tons of debris. Screams were coming at her from every direction. People were crying for help. She was breathing dust, and her eyes and nose were caked over. She was pulling her master through a scene of absolute pandemonium. No training could have prepared her for this, and every natural instinct demanded she run away as fast as she could go to safety. Yet her sense of duty kept pushing her forward. Though she couldn't understand the concept of Hingston not being able to see, she still somehow knew that without her leading the way, this man would be lost. She and he were a team, and that team was going to either live together or die together. Behind her, Hingston was covering his mouth and trying to catch his breath. Yet he wasn't thinking only of himself. He had so much faith in the dog that was now guiding him blindly through the New York streets that he latched onto others and urged them to follow. Those who had stopped in shock, frozen in place, and so overcome by bewilderment they had given up, awoke with new hope. No longer was a Rizal just leading Kingston. Now there were many following behind her. If he had not been caught in the drive to survive, Hingston might have stopped and marveled at his dog's incredible fortitude. Nothing was going to stop her. Even the sirens and screams were not going to slow her down. She had to get him to a place he would feel secure. What an amazing dog she was. This guide dog for the blind had become a guide dog for everyone. A voice called out through the dust, begging those running to come inside. Hingston pushed Roselle right and then trusted her to guide him to that friendly voice. The others following behind the dog fell in place as well. A few moments later, a door opened and half a dozen refugees rushed in. Hingston wanted to get as far into the building as possible. Everything in his being yelled at him to hurriedly move forward and race into the unknown. But just as they entered, Roselle stopped and would not move. Even as others pushed from behind, the dog held its ground. Few realized this was a subway entrance. Though covered with dust, panting deeply, and barely able to see, the dog would not allow anyone to charge forward, because doing so meant plunging down the stairs. This simple act, so essential in guide dog training, likely saved several, including Kingston, from severe injuries or death, so not only did she lead them to safety, she kept them safe once they arrived. It took a full day for Hingston and Rizal to make it home. The still dust covered man was exhausted and worn out when he finally felt his wife's arm around his neck. As they hugged and cried, Rizal, now no longer on harness and not needed to guide her master, picked up a toy and began and begged to play. Though terrorists had brought down both World Trade Center's towers and damaged the Pentagon, though they had shaken the country and its people to the core, the simple act of being ready to play proved they couldn't phase or defeat Rizal. Her response during the moments after tragedy reflected her incredible training and her reaction when she had arrived home foreshadowed the will and determination of the people of the United States to not let the violent and evil acts of this day quash the American dream or way of life. Roselle would, li would live another decade, but her service as a guide dog was cut short due to health issues likely caused by the dust she inhaled as she left Michael Hankston out of the cloud of debris. Still, even though she was no longer leading her master, her career was far from over. In the years after 9-11, she appeared in a wide variety of television talk shows that became the living symbol of the value of service dogs. During that time, his priorities deeply changed by what he experienced in Tower One. Hingston left the business world and became a powerful spokesman for employing people with disabilities. 
the much-honored Yellow Lab story and her master's in inspiring life and message are spotlighting in the best-selling book, Thunderdog. So that was a short version of the st full story that would be told in Thunderdog. And it is fascinating to me and also really interesting that it was the dog that helped calm people down and it helped to and Roselle also helped to lead people not only out of the tower but also out of the debris field and then stop them from falling down the subway stairs and it really is a way of showing how something simple such as a dog being calm and being focused on what they've been trained to do helped calm everyone else down and help people through a situation even if that wasn't necessarily the intention of the training and I think that's important and I also think it's it's a beautiful thing and it is a wonderful story and I really hope you get to read it so I would like to thank you today for joining me Chris Wolf as we did an adult story time at King Public Library about extraordinary animals specifically focused on service dogs of all kinds and I would very much enjoy for you to stop by and we can either talk about these books or get you some in it'll be wonderful and I would also like to mention that our summer rowing program for which this is program four is currently ongoing still but it will end on August 2nd and we would like all reading logs turned in by that time and we will be doing our drawing for prizes on August 6th so you still have time to sign up and possibly get a few books read. I would also like to mention that we have a new packet of uh, mind games that are word based for adults and they're available here at the library and we also are going to be starting a new book club hopefully soon and I would very much like to thank you for joining me today. I hope you are able to stop by the library and you can check out books or puzzles or whatever you'd like and I also hope you are having a wonderful day and we will see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye bye!